Section 7 of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in November 2011. Letter 6, Part 2. By seven the next morning, the rice was eaten, the room as bare as if it had never been occupied, the bill of eighty sen paid, the housemaster and servants with many sayonaras or farewells had prostrated themselves, and we were away in the krumas at a rapid trot. At the first halt, my runner, a kindly, good-natured creature, but absolutely hideous, was seized with pain and vomiting owing he said to drinking the bad water at kazukabe and was left behind he pleased me much by the honest independent way in which he provided a substitute strictly adhering to his bargain and never asking for a gratuity on account of his illness he had been so kind and helpful that i felt quite sad at leaving him there ill only a coolie to be sure only an atom among the thirty-four million of the empire but not less precious to our Father in Heaven than any other. It was a brilliant day, with the mercury eighty-six degrees in the shade, but the heat was not oppressive. At noon we reached the Tone, and I rode on a coolie's tattooed shoulders through the shallow part, and then, with the Kurumas, some ill-disposed pack-horses, and a number of travellers, crossed in a flat-bottomed boat. The boatmen, travellers, and cultivators were nearly or altogether without clothes, but the richer farmers worked in the fields in curved bamboo hats as large as umbrellas, kimonos with large sleeves not girt up, and large fans attached to their girdles. Many of the travellers whom we met were without hats, but shielded the front of the head by holding a fan between it and the sun. Probably the inconvenience of the national costume for working men partly accounts for the general practice of getting rid of it. It is such a hindrance, even in walking, that most pedestrians have their loins girded up by taking the middle of the hem at the bottom of the kimono and tucking it under the girdle. This, in the case of many, shows woven, tight-fitting, elastic, white cotton pantaloons reaching to the ankles. After ferrying another river at a village from which a steamer plies to Tokyo, the country became much more pleasing, the rice fields fewer, the trees, houses, and barns larger, and in the distance high hills loomed faintly through the haze. Much of the wheat, of which they don't make bread but vermicelli, is already being carried. You see wheat stacks, ten feet high, moving slowly, and while you are wandering, you become aware of four feet moving below them, for all the crop is carried on horses, if not on human backs. I went to see several threshing floors, clean open spaces outside barns, where the grain is laid on mats and threshed by two or four men with heavy revolving flails. Another method is for women to beat out the grain on racks of split bamboo laid lengthwise, and I saw yet a third practised both in the fields and barnyards, in which women pass handfuls of stalks backwards through a sort of carding instrument, with sharp iron teeth placed in a slanting position, which cuts off the ears, leaving the stalk unbruised. This is probably the sharp threshing instrument having teeth, mentioned by Isaiah. The ears are then rubbed between the hands. In this region the wheat was winnowed altogether by hand, and after the wind had driven the chaff away, the grain was laid out on mats to dry. Sickles are not used, but the reaper takes a handful of stalks and cuts them off close to the ground with a short, straight knife, fixed at a right angle with the handle. The wheat is sown in rows with wide spaces between them, which are utilized for beans and other crops, and no sooner is it removed than daikon, raphanus sativus cucumbers or some other vegetable takes its place as the land under careful tillage and copious manuring bears two and even three crops in the year the soil is trenched for wheat as for all crops except rice not a weed is to be seen and the whole country looks like a well-kept garden 
the barns in this district are very handsome and many of their grand roofs have that concave sweep with which we are familiar in the pagoda the eaves are often eight feet deep and the thatch three feet thick several of the farmyards have handsome gateways like the ancient lich gates of some of our english churchyards much magnified as animals are not used for milk draught or food and there are no pasture lands both the country and the farmyards have a singular silence and an inanimate look a mean-looking dog and a few fowls being the only representatives of domestic animal life i long for the lowing of cattle and the bleating of sheep at six we reached tochigi a large town formerly the castle town of a daimyo its special manufacture is rope of many kinds a great deal of hemp being grown in the neighbourhood many of the roofs are tiled and the town has a more solid and handsome appearance than those that we had previously passed through but from kazukabe to tochigi was from bad to worse i nearly abandoned japanese travelling altogether and if last night had not been a great improvement i think i should have gone ignominiously back to tokyo the yadoya was a very large one and as sixty guests had arrived before me there was no choice of accommodation and i had to be contented with a room enclosed on all sides not by fusuma but shoji and with barely room for my bed bath and chair under a fusty green mosquito net which was a perfect nest of fleas one side of the room was against a much frequented passage and another opened on a small yard upon which three opposite rooms also opened crowded with some not very sober or decorous travellers the shoji were full of holes and often at each hole i saw a human eye privacy was a luxury not even to be recalled besides the constant application of eyes to the shoji the servants who were very noisy and rough looked into my room constantly without any pretext the host a bright pleasant-looking man did the same jugglers musicians blind shampooers and singing girls all pushed the screens aside and i began to think that mr campbell was right and that a lady should not travel alone in japan ito who had the room next to mine suggested that robbery was quite likely and asked to be allowed to take charge of my money but did not decamp with it during the night i lay down on my precarious stretcher before eight but as the night advanced the din of the house increased till it became truly diabolical and never ceased till after one drums tom-toms and cymbals were beaten kotos and samisens screeched and twanged geishas professional women with the accomplishments of dancing singing and playing danced accompanied by songs whose jerking discords were most laughable story-tellers recited tales in a high key and the running about and splashing close to my room never ceased late at night my precarious shoji were accidentally thrown down revealing a scene of great hilarity in which a number of people were bathing and throwing water over each other the noise of departures began at daylight and i was glad to leave at seven before you go the fusuma are slidden back and what was your room becomes part of a great open matted space an arrangement which effectually prevents fustiness though the road was up a slight incline and the men were too tired to trot we made thirty miles in nine hours the kindliness and courtesy of the coolies to me and to each other was a constant source of pleasure to me it is most amusing to see the elaborate politeness of the greetings of men clothed only in hats and marrows the hat is invariably removed when they speak to each other and three profound bows are never omitted soon after leaving the yadoya we passed through a wide street with the largest and handsomest houses i have yet seen on both sides they were all open in front their highly polished floors and passages looked like still water the kakemonos or wall pictures on their side walls were extremely beautiful and their mats were very fine and white there were large gardens at the back with fountains and flowers and streams crossed by light stone bridges sometimes flowed through the houses 
from the signs I supposed them to be Yadoyas, but on asking Ito why we had not put up at one of them, he replied that they were all Kashitsukeya, or tea-houses of disreputable character, a very sad fact. As we journeyed, the country became prettier and prettier, rolling up to abrupt wooded hills with mountains in the clouds behind. The farming villages are comfortable and embowered in wood, and the richer farmers seclude their dwellings by closely clipped hedges, or rather screens, two feet wide and often twenty feet high. Tea grew near every house, and its leaves were being gathered and dried on mats. Signs of silk culture began to appear in shrubberies of mulberry trees, and white and sulphur-yellow cocoons were lying in the sun along the road in flat trays. Numbers of women sat in the fronts of the houses, weaving cotton cloth fifteen inches wide, and cotton yarn, mostly imported from England, was being dyed in all the villages, the dye used being a native indigo, the polygonum tinctorium. Old women were spinning, and young and old usually pursued their avocations with wise-looking babies tucked into the backs of their dresses, and peering cunningly over their shoulders. Even little girls of seven and eight were playing at children's games with babies on their backs, and those who were too small to carry real ones had big dolls strapped on in similar fashion. Innumerable villages, crowded houses, and babies in all give one the impression of a very populous country. As the day wore on in its brightness and glory, the pictures became more varied and beautiful. Great snow-slashed mountains looked over the foothills, on whose steep sides the dark blue-green of pine and cryptomeria was lighted up by the spring tints of deciduous trees. There were groves of cryptomeria on small hills, crowned by Shinto shrines, approached by grand flights of stone stairs. The red gold of the harvest fields contrasted with the fresh green and exquisite leafage of the hemp, Rose and white azaleas lighted up the copse woods, and when the broad road passed into the colossal avenue of Cryptomeria, which overshadows the way to the sacred shrines of Nikko, and tremulous sunbeams and shadows flecked the grass, I felt that Japan was beautiful, and that the mud flats of Yedo were only an ugly dream. Two roads lead to Nikko. I avoided the one usually taken by Utsunomiya, and by doing so lost the most magnificent of the two avenues, which extends for nearly fifty miles along the great highway called the Oshiu Kaido. Along the Reheshi Kaido, the road by which I came, it extends for thirty miles, and the two, broken frequently by villages, converge upon the village of Imaichi, eight miles from Nikko, where they unite, and only terminate at the entrance of the town. They are said to have been planted as an offering to the buried shoguns by a man who was too poor to place a bronze lantern at their shrines. A grander monument could not have been devised, and they are probably the grandest things of their kind in the world. The avenue of the Reheshikaido is a good carriage road with sloping banks eight feet high, covered with grass and ferns. At the top of these are the cryptomeria, then two grassy walks, and between these and the cultivation a screen of saplings and brushwood. A great many of the trees become two at four feet from the ground. Many of the stems are twenty-seven feet in girth. They do not diminish or branch till they have reached a height of from fifty to sixty feet, and the appearance of altitude is aided by the longitudinal splitting of the reddish-coloured bark into strips of about two inches wide. The trees are pyramidal, and at a little distance resemble cedars. There is a deep solemnity about this glorious avenue, with its broad shade and dancing lights, and the rare glimpses of high mountains. Instinct alone would tell one that it leads to something which must be grand and beautiful like itself. It is broken occasionally by small villages with big bells suspended between double poles, by wayside shrines with offerings of rags and flowers, by stone effigies of Buddha and his disciples, 
mostly defaced or overthrown, all wearing the same expression of beatified rest and indifference to mundane affairs, and by temples of lacquered wood falling to decay, whose bells sent their surprisingly sweet tones far on the evening air. Imaichi, where the two stately isles unite, is a long uphill street, with a clear mountain stream enclosed in a stone channel and crossed by hewn stone slabs running down the middle. In a room built over the stream and commanding a view up and down the street, two policemen sat writing. It looks a dull place without much traffic, as if oppressed by the stateliness of the avenues below it and the shrines above it, but it has a quiet yadoya where I had a good night's rest, although my canvas bed was nearly on the ground. We left early this morning in drizzling rain, and went straight uphill under the cryptomeria for eight miles. The vegetation is as profuse as one would expect in so damp and hot a summer climate, and from the prodigious rainfall of the mountains. Every stone is covered with moss, and the road signs are green with the Protococcus viridis and several species of Marcantia. We were among the foothills of the Nantaizan mountains, at a height of one thousand feet, abrupt in their forms, wooded to their summits, and noisy with the dash and tumble of a thousand streams. The long street of Hachi Ishi, with its steep-roofed, deep-eaved houses, its warm colouring and its steep roadway with steps at intervals, has a sort of Swiss picturesqueness as you enter it, as you must, on foot, while your kurumas are hauled and lifted up the steps, nor is the resemblance given by steep roofs, pines and mountains patched with coniferae, altogether lost as you ascend the steep street, and see wood carvings and quaint baskets of wood and grass offered everywhere for sale. It is a truly dull, quaint street, and the people come out to stare at a foreigner, as if foreigners had not become common events since 1870, when Sir H. and Lady Parks, the first Europeans who were permitted to visit Nikko, took up their abode in the imperial hombo. It is a doll's street, with small low houses, so finely matted, so exquisitely clean, so finically neat, so light and delicate, that even when I entered them without my boots I felt like a bull in a china shop, as if my mere weight must smash through and destroy. The street is so painfully clean that I should no more think of walking over it in muddy boots than over a drawing-room carpet. It has a silent mountain look, and most of its shops sell specialities, lacquer work, boxes of sweetmeats made of black beans and sugar, all sorts of boxes, trays, cups, and stands, made of plain, polished wood, and more grotesque articles made from the roots of trees. It was not part of my plan to stay at the beautiful Yadoya, which receives foreigners in Hachiishi, and I sent Ito half a mile farther with a note in Japanese to the owner of the house where I now am, while I sat on a rocky eminence at the top of the street, unmolested by anybody looking over to the solemn groves upon the mountains, where the two greatest of the shoguns sleep in glory. Below, the rushing Dayagawa, swollen by the night's rain, thundered through a narrow gorge. Beyond, colossal flights of stone stairs stretch mysteriously away among cryptomeria groves, above which tower the Nikosan mountains. Just where the torrent finds its impetuosity checked by two stone walls, it is spanned by a bridge, eighty-four feet long by eighteen wide, of dull red lacquer resting on two stone piers on either side, connected by two transverse stone beams. A welcome bit of colour it is amidst the masses of dark greens and soft greys, though there is nothing imposing in its structure, and its interest consists in being the Mihashi, or Sacred Bridge, built in 1636, formerly open only to the shoguns, the envoy of the Mikado, and to pilgrims twice a year. Both its gates are locked. Grand and lonely Nikko looks, the home of rain and mist. Kuruma roads end here, and if you wish to go any farther, you must either walk, ride, or be carried. 
Ito was long away, and the coolies kept addressing me in Japanese, which made me feel helpless and solitary, and eventually they shouldered my baggage, and, descending a flight of steps, we crossed the river by the secular bridge, and shortly met my host, Kanaya, a very bright, pleasant-looking man, who bowed nearly to the earth. Terraced roads in every direction lead through cryptomerias to the shrines, and this one passes many a stately enclosure, but leads away from the temples, and though it is the highway to Chiuzenji, a place of popular pilgrimage, Yumoto, a place of popular resort, and several other villages, it is very rugged, and, having flights of stone steps at intervals, is only practicable for horses and pedestrians. At the house, with the appearance of which I was at once delighted, I regretfully parted with my coolies, who had served me kindly and faithfully. They had paid me many little attentions, such as always beating the dust out of my dress, inflating my air pillow, and bringing me flowers, and were always grateful when I walked up hills. And just now, after going for a frolic to the mountains, they called to wish me good-bye, bringing branches of azaleas. I L B. End of section seven. Seven of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in November two thousand eleven. Kanaya's Nikko, June fifteen. I don't know what to write about my house. It is a Japanese idyll, there is nothing within or without which does not please the eye, and, after the din of yadoyas, its silence, musical with the dash of waters and the twitter of birds, is truly refreshing. It is a simple but irregular two-storied pavilion, standing on a stone-faced terrace approached by a flight of stone steps. The garden is well laid out, and, as peonies, irises, and azaleas are now in blossom, it is very bright. The mountain, with its lower part covered with red azaleas, rises just behind, and a stream which tumbles down it supplies the house with water, both cold and pure, and another, after forming a miniature cascade, passes under the house and through a fish-pond with rocky islets into the river below. The grey village of Irimichi lies on the other side of the road, shut in with the rushing Daya, and beyond it are high, broken hills, richly wooded, and slashed with ravines and waterfalls. Kanaya's sister, a very sweet, refined-looking woman, met me at the door and divested me of my boots. The two verandas are highly polished, and so are the entrance and the stairs which lead to my room, and the mats are so fine and white that I almost fear to walk over them, even in my stockings. The polished stairs lead to a highly polished broad veranda with a beautiful view, from which you enter one large room, which, being too large, was at once made into two. Four highly polished steps lead from this into an exquisite room at the back, which Ito occupies, and another polished staircase into the bathhouse and garden. The whole front of my room is composed of shoji, which slide back during the day. The ceiling is of light wood, crossed by bars of dark wood, and the posts which support it are of dark polished wood. The panels are of wrinkled sky-blue paper splashed with gold. At one end are two alcoves with floors of polished wood, called tokonoma. In one hangs a kakemono, or wall picture, a painting of a blossoming branch of the cherry on white silk, a perfect piece of art, which in itself fills the room with freshness and beauty. The artist who painted it painted nothing but cherry blossoms, and fell in the rebellion. On a shelf in the other alcove is a very valuable cabinet with sliding doors, on which peonies are painted on a gold ground. A single spray of rose azalea in a pure white vase hanging on one of the polished posts, and a single iris in another, are the only decorations. The mats are very fine and white, 
but the only furniture is a folding screen with some suggestions of landscape in Indian ink. I almost wish that the rooms were a little less exquisite, for I am in constant dread of spilling the ink, indenting the mats, or tearing the paper windows. Downstairs there is a room equally beautiful, and a large space where all the domestic avocations are carried on. There is a gura, or fireproof storehouse, with a tiled roof, on the right of the house. Kanaya leads the discords at the Shinto shrines, but his duties are few, and he is chiefly occupied in perpetually embellishing his house and garden. His mother, a venerable old lady, and his sister, the sweetest and most graceful Japanese woman but one that I have seen, live with him. She moves about the house like a floating fairy, and her voice has music in its tones. A half-witted servant-man and the sister's boy and girl complete the family. Kanaya is the chief man in the village, and is very intelligent and apparently well educated. He has divorced his wife, and his sister has practically divorced her husband. Of late, to help his income, he has let these charming rooms to foreigners who have brought letters to him, and he is very anxious to meet their views, while his good taste leads him to avoid Europeanizing his beautiful home. Supper came up on a zen, or a small table, six inches high, of old gold lacquer, with the rice in a gold lacquer bowl, and the teapot and cup were fine kaga porcelain. For my two rooms, with rice and tea, I pay two shillings a day. Ito forages for me, and can occasionally get chickens at ten pence each, and a dish of trout for six pence, and eggs are always to be had for one penny each. It is extremely interesting to live in a private house, and to see the externalities, at least, of domestic life in a Japanese middle-class home. I. L. B. End of Letter 7「Of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan」by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Hawaii in February 2012. Letter 8. Kanayas, Nikko, June 21st. I have been at Nikko for nine days and am therefore entitled to use the word Kekko. Nikko means sunny splendor, and its beauties are celebrated in poetry and art all over Japan. Mountains for a great part of the year clothed or patched with snow, piled in great ranges round Nantaizan, their monarch, worshipped as a god. Forests of magnificent timber, ravines and passes scarcely explored, dark green lakes sleeping in endless serenity, the deep abyss of Kegon, into which the waters of Chuzenji plunge from a height of 250 feet, the bright beauty of the falls of Kirifuri, the loveliness of the gardens of Dainichido, the sombre grandeur of the passes through which the Dayagawa forces its way from the upper regions, a gorgeousness of azaleas and magnolias, and a luxuriousness of vegetation perhaps unequalled in Japan, are only a few of the attractions which surround the shrines of the two greatest shoguns. To a glorious resting place on the hill slope of Hotoke Iwa, sacred since 767, when a Buddhist saint called Shodo Shonin visited it and declared the old Shinto deity of the mountain to be only a manifestation of Buddha, Hiretada, the second shogun of the Tokugawa dynasty, conveyed the corpse of his father, Ieyasu, in 1617. It was a splendid burial. An imperial envoy, a priest of the Mikado's family, court nobles from Kyoto, and hundreds of daimyos, captains, and nobles of inferior rank took part in the ceremony. An army of priests in rich robes during three days intoned a sacred classic ten thousand times, and Ieyasu was deified by a decree of the Mikado under a name signifying Light of the East, Great Incarnation of Buddha. The less important shoguns of the line of Tokugawa are buried in Uyeno and Shiba in Yedo. 
since the restoration and what may be called the disestablishment of buddhism the shrine of ieyasu has been shorn of all its glories of ritual and its magnificent buddhist paraphernalia the two hundred priests who gave it splendor are scattered and six shinto priests alternately attend upon it as much for the purpose of selling tickets of admission as for any priestly duties all roads bridges and avenues here lead to these shrines but the grand approach is by the red bridge and up a broad road with steps at intervals and stone-faced embankments at each side on the top of which are belts of cryptomeria at the summit of this ascent is a fine granite torii twenty seven feet six inches high with columns three feet six inches in diameter offered by the daimyo of chikuzen in 1618 from his own quarries after this come 118 magnificent bronze lanterns on massive stone pedestals each of which is inscribed with the posthumous title of ieyasu the name of the giver and the legend of the offering all the gifts of daimyo a holy water cistern made of a solid block of granite and covered by a roof resting on twenty square granite pillars and a bronze bell lantern and candelabra of marvellous workmanship offered by the kings of korea and liukyu on the left is a five-storied pagoda one hundred four feet high richly carved in wood and as richly gilded and painted the signs of the zodiac run round the lower story the grand entrance gate is at the top of a handsome flight of steps forty yards from the torii a looped white curtain with the mikado's crest in black hangs partially over the gateway in which beautiful as it is one does not care to linger to examine the gilded amainu in niches or the spirited carvings of tigers under the eaves for the view of the first court overwhelms one by its magnificence and beauty the whole style of the buildings the arrangements the art of every kind the thought which inspires the whole are exclusively japanese and the glimpse from the ni o gate is a revelation of a previously undreamed of beauty both in form and colour round the neatly pebbled court which is enclosed by a bright red timber wall are three gorgeous buildings which contain the treasures of the temple a sumptuous stable for the three sacred albino horses which are kept for the use of the god a magnificent granite cistern of holy water fed from the somendaki cascade and a highly decorated building in which a complete collection of buddhist scriptures is deposited from this a flight of steps leads into a smaller court containing a bell tower of marvellous workmanship and ornamentation a drum tower hardly less beautiful a shrine the candelabra bell and lantern mentioned before and some very grand bronze lanterns from this court another flight of steps ascends to the yomei gate whose splendour i contemplated day after day with increasing astonishment the white columns which support it have capitals formed of great red-throated heads of the mythical kirin above the architrave is a projecting balcony which runs all round the gateway with a railing carried by dragons heads in the centre two white dragons fight eternally underneath in high relief there are groups of children playing then a network of richly painted beams and seven groups of chinese sages the high roof is supported by gilded dragon's heads with crimson throats in the interior of the gateway there are side niches painted white which are lined with gracefully designed arabesques founded on the botan or peony a piazza whose outer walls of twenty-one compartments are enriched with magnificent carvings of birds flowers and trees runs left and right and encloses on three of its sides another court the fourth side of which is a terminal stone wall built against the side of the hill on the right are two decorated buildings one of which contains a stage for the performance of the sacred dances and the other an altar for the burning of cedar wood incense on the left is a building for the reception of the three sacred cars which were used during festivals to pass from court to court is to pass from splendour to splendour 
one is almost glad to feel that this is the last and that the strain on one's capacity for admiration is nearly over in the middle is the sacred enclosure formed of gilded trellis work with painted borders above and below forming a square of which each side measures one hundred fifty feet and which contains the hyden or chapel underneath the trellis work are groups of birds with backgrounds of grass very boldly carved in wood and richly gilded and painted from the imposing entrance through a double avenue of cryptomeria among courts gates temples shrines pagodas colossal bells of bronze and lanterns inlaid with gold you pass through this final court bewildered by magnificence through golden gates into the dimness of a golden temple and there is simply a black lacquer table with a circular metal mirror upon it within is a hall finely matted forty-two feet wide by twenty-seven from front to back with lofty apartments on each side one for the shogun and the other for his holiness the abbot both of course are empty the roof of the hall is panelled and richly frescoed the shogun's room contains some very fine fusuma on which kirin fabulous monsters are depicted on a dead gold ground and four oak panels eight feet by six finely carved with the phoenix in low relief variously treated in the abbot's room there are similar panels adorned with hawks spiritedly executed the only ecclesiastical ornament among the dim splendours of the chapel is the plain gold gohe steps at the back lead into a chapel paved with stone with a fine panelled ceiling representing dragons on a dark blue ground beyond this some gilded doors lead into the principal chapel containing four rooms which are not accessible but if they correspond with the outside which is of highly polished black lacquer relieved by gold they must be severely magnificent but not in any one of these gorgeous shrines did iyeyasu decree that his dust should rest re-entering the last court it is necessary to leave the enclosures altogether by passing through a covered gateway in the eastern piazza into a stone gallery green with mosses and hepatice within wealth and art have created a fairyland of gold and colour without nature at her stateliest has surrounded the great shogun's tomb with a pomp of mournful splendour a staircase of two hundred forty stone steps leads to the top of the hill where above and behind all the stateliness of the shrines raised in his honour the dust of iyeyasu sleeps in an unadorned but cyclopean tomb of stone and bronze surmounted by a bronze urn in front is a stone table decorated with a bronze incense burner a vase with lotus blossoms and leaves in brass and a bronze stork bearing a bronze candlestick in its mouth a lofty stone wall surmounted by a balustrade surrounds the simple but stately enclosure and cryptomeria of large size growing upon the back of the hill create perpetual twilight round it slant rays of sunshine alone pass through them no flower blooms or bird sings only silence and mournfulness surround the grave of the ablest and greatest man that japan has produced impressed as i had been with the glorious workmanship in wood bronze and lacquer i scarcely admired less the masonry of the vast retaining walls the stone gallery the staircase and its balustrade all put together without mortar or cement and so accurately fitted that the joints are scarcely affected by the rain damp and aggressive vegetation of two hundred sixty years the steps of the staircase are fine monoliths and the coping at the side the massive balustrade and the heavy rail at the top are cut out of solid blocks of stone from ten to eighteen feet in length nor is the workmanship of the great granite cistern for holy water less remarkable it is so carefully adjusted on its bed that the water brought from a neighbouring cascade rises and pours over each edge in such carefully equalised columns that as mr sato says it seems to be a solid block of water rather than a piece of stone 
the temples of iemitsu are close to those of ieyasu and those somewhat less magnificent are even more bewildering as they are still in buddhist lands and are crowded with the gods of the buddhist pantheon and the splendid paraphernalia of buddhist worship in striking contrast to the simplicity of the lonely shinto mirror in the midst of the blaze of gold and colour in the grand entrance gate are gigantic Nio, the buddhist gog and magog vermilion coloured and with draperies painted in imitation of flowered silk a second pair painted red and green removed from iemitsu's temple are in niches within the gate a flight of steps leads to another gate in whose gorgeous niches stand hideous monsters in human form representing the gods of wind and thunder wind has crystal eyes and a half jolly half demoniacal expression he is painted green and carries a wind-bag on his back a long sack tied at each end with the ends brought over his shoulders and held in his hands the god of thunder is painted red with purple hair on end and stands on clouds holding thunderbolts in his hand more steps and another gate containing the tenno or gods of the four quarters boldly carved and in strong action with long eye-teeth and at last the principal temple is reached an old priest who took me over it on my first visit on passing the gods of wind and thunder said we used to believe in these things but we don't now and his manner in speaking of other deities was rather contemptuous he requested me however to take off my hat as well as my shoes at the door of the temple Within there was a gorgeous shrine, and when an acolyte drew aside the curtain of cloth of gold, the interior was equally imposing, containing Buddha and two other figures of gilded brass, seated cross-legged on lotus flowers, with rows of petals several times repeated, and with that look of eternal repose on their faces which is reproduced in the commonest roadside images in front of the shrine several candles were burning the offerings of some people who were having prayers said for them and the hall was lighted by two lamps burning low on a step of the altar a much contorted devil was crouching uneasily for he was subjugated and by a grim irony made to carry a massive incense burner on his shoulders in this temple there were more than a hundred idols standing in rows many of them life-size some of them trampling devils under their feet but all hideous partly from the bright greens vermilions and blues with which they are painted remarkable muscular development characterizes all and the figures or faces are all in vigorous action of some kind generally grossly exaggerated while we were crossing the court there were two shocks of earthquake all the golden wind-bells which fringed the roofs rang softly and a number of priests ran into the temple and beat various kinds of drums for the space of half an hour iemitsu's tomb is reached by flights of steps on the right of the chapel it is in the same style as ieyasu's but the gates in front are of bronze and are inscribed with large sanskrit characters in bright brass one of the most beautiful of the many views is from the uppermost gate of the temple the sun shone on my second visit and brightened the spring tints of the trees on hotokeiwa which was vignetted by a frame of dark cryptomeria some of the buildings are roofed with sheet copper but most of them are tiled tiling however has been raised almost to the dignity of a fine art in japan the tiles themselves are a coppery grey with a suggestion of metallic lustre about it they are slightly concave and the joints are covered by others quite convex which come down like massive tubes from the ridge pole and terminate at the eaves with discs on which the tokugawa badge is emblazoned in gold as it is everywhere on these shrines where it would not be quite out of keeping the roofs are so massive that they require all the strength of the heavy carved timbers below and like all else they gleam with gold or that which simulates it the shrines are the most wonderful work of their kind in japan in their stately setting of cryptomeria few of which are less than twenty feet in girth at three feet from the ground they take one prisoner by their beauty 
in defiance of all rules of western art and compel one to acknowledge the beauty of forms and combinations of colour hitherto unknown and that lacquered wood is capable of lending itself to the expression of a very high idea in art gold has been used in profusion and black dull red and white with a breadth and lavishness quite unique the bronze fretwork alone is a study and the wood carving needs weeks of earnest work for the mastery of its ideas and details one screen or railing only has sixty panels each four feet long carved with marvellous boldness and depth in open work representing peacocks pheasants storks lotuses peonies bamboos and foliage the fidelity to form and colour in the birds and the reproduction of the glory of motion could not be excelled yet the flowers please me even better truly the artist has revelled in his work and has carved and painted with joy the lotus leaf retains its dewy bloom the peony its shades of creamy white the bamboo leaf still trembles on its graceful stem in contrast to the rigid needles of the pine and countless corollas in all the perfect colouring of passionate life unfold themselves amidst the leafage of the gorgeous tracery these carvings are from ten to fifteen inches deep and single feathers in the tails of the pheasants stand out fully six inches in front of peonies nearly as deep the details fade from my memory daily as i leave the shrines and in their place are picturesque masses of black and red lacquer and gold gilded doors opening without noise halls laid with matting so soft that not a footfall sounds across whose twilight the sunbeams fall aslant on richly arabesqued walls and panels carved with birds and flowers and on ceilings panelled and wrought with elaborate art of inner shrines of gold and golden lilies six feet high and curtains of gold brocade and incense fumes and colossal bells and golden ridge poles of the mythical fauna kirin dragon and hobo of elephants apes and tigers strangely mingled with flowers and trees and golden tracery and diaper work on a gold ground and lacquer screens and pagodas and groves of bronze lanterns and shaven priests in gold brocade and shinto attendants in black lacquer caps and gleams of sunlit gold here and there and simple monumental urns and a mountainside covered with a cryptomeria forest with rose azaleas lighting up its solemn shade i l b end of section 9「Unbeaten Tracks in Japan」by Isabella L. Bird This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avei in February 2012 Letter 9 Yashimaya, Yumoto, Nikosan Mountains, June 22nd Today I have made an experimental journey on horseback, have done 15 miles in 8 hours of continuous travelling, and have encountered for the first time the Japanese pack-horse, an animal of which many unpleasing stories are told, and which has hitherto been as mythical to me as the kirin, or dragon. I have neither been kicked, bitten, nor pitched off, however, for mares are used exclusively in this district, gentle creatures about fourteen hands high, with weak hind quarters, and heads nearly concealed by shaggy manes and forelocks. They are led by a rope round the nose and go barefoot, except on stony ground, when the mago, or man who leads them, ties straw sandals on their feet. The pack saddle is composed of two packs of straw eight inches thick, faced with red, and connected before and behind by strong oak arches gaily painted or lacquered. There is for a girth a rope loosely tied under the body, and the security of the load depends on a crupper usually a piece of bamboo attached to the saddle by ropes strung with wooden counters and another rope round the neck in which you put your foot as you scramble over the high front upon the top of the erection the load must be carefully balanced or it comes to grief and the mago handles it all over first 
and if an accurate division of weight is impossible as a stone to one side or the other here women who wear enormous rain hats and gird their kimonos over tight blue trousers both load the horses and lead them i dropped upon my loaded horse from the top of a wall the ridges bars tags and knotted rigging of the saddle being smoothed over by a folded futon or wedded cotton quilt and i was then fourteen inches above the animal's back with my feet hanging over his neck you must balance yourself carefully or you bring the whole erection over but balancing soon becomes a matter of habit if the horse does not stumble the pack saddle is tolerable on level ground but most severe on the spine in going uphill and so intolerable in going down that i was relieved when i found that i had slid over the horse's head into a mud hole and you are quite helpless as he does not understand a bridle if you have one and blindly follows his leader who trudges on six feet in front of him the hard day's journey ended in an exquisite yadoya beautiful within and without and more fit for fairies than for travel soiled mortals the fusuma a light plained wood with a sweet scent the matting nearly white the balconies polished pine on entering a smiling girl brought me some plum flower tea with a delicate almond flavour a sweet meat made of beans and sugar and a lacquer bowl of frozen snow after making a difficult meal from a fowl of much experience i spent the evening out of doors as a japanese watering place is an interesting novelty there is scarcely room between the lake and the mountains for the picturesque village with its trim neat houses one above another built of reddish cedar newly planed the snow lies ten feet deep here in winter and on october ten the people wrap their beautiful dwellings up in coarse matting not even leaving the roofs uncovered and go to the low country till may ten leaving one man in charge who is relieved once a week were the houses mine i should be tempted to wrap them up on every rainy day i did quite the wrong thing in riding here it is proper to be carried up in a cargo or covered basket the village consists of two short streets eight feet wide composed entirely of yadoyas of various grades with a picturesquely varied frontage of deep eaves graceful balconies rows of chinese lanterns and open lower fronts the place is full of people and the four bathing sheds were crowded some energetic invalids bathed twelve times a day every one who was walking about carried a blue towel over his arm and the rails of the balconies were covered with blue towels hanging to dry there can be very little amusement the mountains rise at once from the village and are so covered with jungle that one can only walk in the short streets or along the track by which i came there is one covered boat for excursions on the lake and a few geishas were playing the samisen but as gaming is illegal and there is no place of public resort except the bathing sheds people must spend nearly all their time in bathing sleeping smoking and eating the great spring is beyond the village in a square tank in a mound it bubbles up with much strength giving off fetid fumes there are broad boards laid at intervals across it and people crippled with rheumatism go and lie for hours upon them for the advantage of the sulphurous steam the temperature of the spring is one hundred thirty degrees fahrenheit but after the water has travelled to the village along an open wooden pipe it is only eighty four degrees yumoto is over four thousand feet high and very cold Irimichi before leaving yumoto i saw the modus operandi of a squeeze i asked for the bill when instead of giving it to me the host ran upstairs and asked ito how much it should be the two dividing the overcharge your servant gets a squeeze on everything you buy and on your hotel expenses and as it is managed very adroitly and you cannot prevent it it is best not to worry about it so long as it keeps within reasonable limits I L B End of section ten of 
of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in March 2012. Letter 10, Part 1. Irimichi, Nikko, June 23rd. My peacefully monotonous life here is nearly at an end. The people are so quiet and kindly, though almost too still, and I have learned to know something of the externals of village life and have become quite fond of the place. The village of Irimichi, which epitomizes for me at present the village life of Japan, consists of about three hundred houses built along three roads, across which steps in fours and threes are placed at intervals. Down the middle of each a rapid stream runs in a stone channel, and this gives endless amusement to the children, especially to the boys, who devise many ingenious models and mechanical toys which are put in motion by water wheels. But at 7 a.m. a drum beats to summon the children to a school whose buildings would not discredit any school board at home. Too much Europeanized, I thought it, and the children looked very uncomfortable sitting on high benches in front of desks, instead of squatting, native fashion. The school apparatus is very good, and there are fine maps on the walls. The teacher, a man about twenty-five, made very free use of the blackboard, and questioned his pupils with much rapidity. The best answer moved its giver to the head of the class, as with us. Obedience is the foundation of the Japanese social order, and with children accustomed to unquestioning obedience at home, the teacher has no trouble in securing quietness, attention, and docility. There was almost a painful earnestness in the old-fashioned faces which poured over the school books. Even such a rare event as the entrance of a foreigner failed to distract these childish students. The younger pupils were taught chiefly by object lessons, and the older were exercised in reading geographical and historical books aloud, a very high key being adopted and a most disagreeable tone, both with the Chinese and Japanese pronunciation. Arithmetic and the elements of some of the branches of natural philosophy are also taught. The children recited a verse of poetry which I understood contained the whole of the simple syllabary. It has been translated thus. Color and perfume vanish away. What can be lasting in this world? Today disappears in the abyss of nothingness. It is but the passing image of a dream, and causes only a slight trouble. It is the echo of the wearied sensualist's cry, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity, and indicates the singular oriental distaste for life, but is a dismal ditty for young children to learn. The Chinese classics, formerly the basis of Japanese education, are now mainly taught as a vehicle for conveying a knowledge of the Chinese character, in acquiring even a moderate acquaintance with which the children undergo a great deal of useless toil. The penalties for bad conduct used to be a few blows with a switch on the front of the leg, or a slight burn with the moxa on the forefinger, still a common punishment in households, but I understood the teacher to say that detention in the schoolhouse is the only punishment now resorted to, and he expressed great disapprobation of our plan of imposing an added task. When twelve o'clock came, the children marched in orderly fashion out of the school grounds, the boys in one division and the girls in another, after which they quietly dispersed. On going home, the children dine, and in the evening in nearly every house you hear the monotonous hum of the preparation of lessons. After dinner they are liberated for play, but the girls often hang about the house with babies on their backs the whole afternoon nursing dolls. One evening I met a procession of sixty boys and girls, all carrying white flags with black balls, except the leader, who carried a white flag with a gilded ball, and they sang, or rather howled, as they walked, but the other amusements have been of a most sedentary kind. The mechanical toys worked by water-wheels in the stream are most fascinating. 
Formal children's parties have been given in this house, for which formal invitations, in the name of a house child, a girl of twelve, are sent out. About 3 p.m. the guests arrived, frequently attended by servants, and this child, Haru, receives them at the top of the stone steps and conducts each into the reception room, where they are arranged according to some well-understood rules of precedence. Haru's hair is drawn back, raised in front, and gathered into a double loop, in which some scarlet crepe is twisted. Her face and throat are much whitened, the paint terminating in three points at the back of the neck, from which all the short hair has been carefully extracted with pincers. Her lips are slightly touched with red paint, and her face looks like that of a cheap doll. She wears a blue, flowered silk kimono, with sleeves touching the ground, a blue girdle lined with scarlet, and a fold of scarlet crepe lies between her painted neck and her kimono. On her little feet she wears white tabi, socks of cotton cloth, with a separate place for the great toe, so as to allow the scarlet-covered thongs of the finely lacquered clogs which she puts on when she stands on the stone steps to receive her guests, to pass between it and the smaller toes. All the other little ladies were dressed in the same style, and all looked like ill-executed dolls. She met them with very formal but graceful bows. When they were all assembled, she and her very graceful mother, squatting before each, presented tea and sweetmeats on lacquer trays, and then they played at very quiet and polite games till dusk. They addressed each other by their names with the honorific prefix O, only used in the case of women, and the respectful affix San. Thus, Haru becomes O Haru-san, which is equivalent to Miss. A mistress of a house is addressed as O Kami-san, and O Kusuma, something like My Lady, is used to married ladies. Women have no surnames, thus you do not speak of Mrs. Saguchi, but of the wife of Saguchi-san, and you would address her as Okusuma. Among the children's names were Haru, Spring, Yuki, Snow, Hana, Blossom, Kiku, Chrysanthemum, Jin, Silver. One of their games was most amusing and was played with some spirit and much dignity. It consisted in one child feigning sickness and another playing the doctor, and the pompousness and gravity of the latter and the distress and weakness of the former were most successfully imitated. Unfortunately, the doctor killed his patient, who counterfeited the death sleep very effectively with her whitened face, and then followed the funeral and the mourning. They dramatized thus weddings, dinner parties, and many other of the events of life. The dignity and self-possession of these children are wonderful. The fact is that their initiation into all that is required by the rules of Japanese etiquette begins as soon as they can speak, so that by the time they are ten years old they know exactly what to do and avoid under all possible circumstances. Before they went away, tea and sweetmeats were again handed round and, as it is neither etiquette to refuse them or to leave anything behind that you have once taken, several of the small ladies slip the residue in their capacious sleeves. On departing, the same formal courtesies were used as on arriving. Yuki, Haru's mother, speaks, acts, and moves with a charming gracefulness. Except at night and when friends drop in to afternoon tea, as they often do, she is always either at domestic avocations, such as cleaning, sewing or cooking, or planting vegetables, or weeding them. All Japanese girls learn how to sew and to make their own clothes, but there are none of the mysteries and difficulties which make the sewing lesson a thing of dread with us. The kimono, haori, and girdle, and even the long hanging sleeves, have only parallel seams, and these are only tacked or basted, as the garments, when washed, are taken to pieces, and each piece, after being very slightly stiffened, is stretched upon a board to dry. There is no underclothing, with its bands, frills, gussets, and buttonholes. The poorer women wear none 
and those above them wear, like Yuki, an underdress of a frothy-looking silk crap, as simply made as the upper one. There are circulating libraries here, as in most villages, and in the evening both Yuki and Haru read love stories or accounts of ancient heroes and heroines, dressed up to suit the popular taste, written in the easiest possible style. Ito has about ten volumes of novels in his room, and spends half the night in reading them. Yuki's son, a lad of thirteen, often comes to my room to display his skill in writing the Chinese character. He is a very bright boy, and shows considerable talent for drawing. Indeed, it is only a short step from writing to drawing. Jotos O hardly involved more breadth and vigour of touch than some of these characters. They are written with a camel's hair brush dipped in Indian ink instead of a pen, and this boy, with two or three vigorous touches, produces characters a foot long, such as are mounted and hung as tablets outside the different shops. Yuki plays the samisen, which may be regarded as the national female instrument, and Haru goes to a teacher daily for lessons on the same. The art of arranging flowers is taught in manuals, the study of which forms part of a girl's education, and there is scarcely a day in which my room is not newly decorated. It is an education to me. I am beginning to appreciate the extreme beauty of solitude in decoration. In the alcove hangs a kakemono of exquisite beauty, a single blossoming branch of the cherry. On one panel of a folding screen there is a single iris. The vases, which hang so gracefully on the polished posts, contain each a single peony, a single iris, a single azalea, stalk, leaves, and corolla, all displayed in their full beauty. Can anything be more grotesque and barbarous than our florist's bouquets, a series of concentric rings of flowers of diverse colors, bordered by maiden hair and a piece of stiff lace paper, in which stems, leaves, and even petals are brutally crushed, and the grace and individuality of each flower systematically destroyed? Kanaya is the chief man in this village, besides being the leader of the dissonant squeaks and discords which represent music at the Shinto festivals, and in some mysterious back region he compounds and sells drugs. Since I have been here, the beautification of his garden has been his chief object, and he has made a very respectable waterfall, a rushing stream, a small lake, a rustic bamboo bridge, and several grass banks, and has transplanted several large trees. He kindly goes out with me a good deal, and, as he is very intelligent, and Ito is proving an excellent, and I think a faithful interpreter, I find it very pleasant to be here. They rise at daylight, fold up the wadded quilts or futons on and under which they have slept, and put them and the wooden pillows, much like stereoscopes in shape, with little rolls of paper or wadding on the top, into a press with a sliding door, sweep the mats carefully, dust all the woodwork in the verandas, open the amado, wooden shutters, which, by sliding in a grove along the edge of the veranda, box in the whole house at night, and retire into an ornamental projection in the day, and throw the paper windows back. Breakfast follows, then domestic avocations, dinner at one, and sewing, gardening, and visiting till six, when they take the evening meal. Visitors usually arrive soon afterwards, and stay till eleven or twelve. Japanese chess, storytelling, and the samisen fill up the early part of the evening, but later an agonizing performance, which they call singing, begins, which sounds like the very essence of heathenishness, and consists mainly in a prolonged vibrating, no. As soon as I hear it, I feel as if I were among savages. Sake or rice beer is always passed round before the visitors leave, in little cups with the gods of luck at the bottom of them. 
sake when heated mounts readily to the head and a single small cup excites the half-witted man-servant to some very foolish musical performances i am sorry to write it but his master and mistress take great pleasure in seeing him make a fool of himself and ito who is from policy a total abstainer goes into convulsions of laughter one evening i was invited to join the family and they entertained me by showing me picture and guide-books most japanese provinces have their guide-books illustrated by woodcuts of the most striking objects and giving itineraries names of yadoyas and other local information one volume of pictures very finely executed on silk was more than a century old old gold lacquer and china and some pieces of antique embroidered silk were also produced for my benefit and some musical instruments of great beauty said to be more than two centuries old none of these treasures are kept in the house but in the kura or fireproof storehouse close by the rooms are not encumbered by ornaments a single kakemono or fine piece of lacquer or china appears for a few days and then makes way for something else so they have variety as well as simplicity and each object is enjoyed in its turn without distraction kanaya and his sister often pay me an evening visit and with branton's map on the floor we project astonishing routes to niigata which are usually abruptly abandoned on finding a mountain chain in the way with never a road over it the life of these people seems to pass easily enough but kanaya deplores the want of money he would like to be rich and intends to build a hotel for foreigners the only vestige of religion in his house is the kamidama or god shelf on which stands a wooden shrine like a shinto temple which contains the memorial tablets to deceased relations each morning a sprig of evergreen and a little rice and sake are placed before it and every evening a lighted lamp End of section 11of unbeaten tracks in japan by isabella l bird this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avai in march 2012 letter 10 part 2 i don't wonder that the japanese rise early for their evenings are cheerless owing to the dismal illumination in this and other houses the lamp consists of a square or circular lacquer stand with four uprights two and a half feet high and panes of white paper a flatted iron dish is suspended in this full of oil with the pith of a rush with a weight in the centre laid across it and one of the projecting ends is lighted this wretched apparatus is called an andon and round its wretched darkness visible the family huddles the children to play games and learn lessons and the women to sew for the japanese daylight is short and the houses are dark almost more deplorable is a candlestick of the same height as the andon with a spike at the top which fits into a hole at the bottom of a farthing candle of vegetable wax with a thick wick made of rolled paper which requires constant snuffing and after giving for a short time a dim and jerky light expires with a bad smell lamps burning mineral oils native and imported are being manufactured on a large scale but a part of the peril connected with them the carriage of oil into country districts is very expensive no japanese would think of sleeping without having an andon burning all night in his room these villages are full of shops there is scarcely a house which does not sell something where the buyers come from and how a profit can be made is a mystery many of the things are eatables such as dry fishes one and a half inch long impaled on sticks cakes sweetmeats composed of rice flour and very little sugar circular lumps of rice dough called mochi roots boiled in brine a white jelly made from beans 
and ropes, straw shoes for men and horses, straw cloaks, paper umbrellas, paper waterproofs, hairpins, toothpicks, tobacco pipes, paper mouchoirs, and numbers of other trifles made of bamboo, straw, grass, and wood. These goods are on stands, and in the room behind, open to the street, all the domestic avocations are going on, and the housewife is usually to be seen boiling water or sewing with a baby tucked into the back of her dress. A lucifer factory has recently been put up, and in many house fronts men are cutting up wood into lengths for matches. In others they are husking rice, a very laborious process, in which the grain is pounded in a mortar sunk in the floor by a flat-ended wooden pestle attached to a long horizontal lever, which is worked by the feet of a man, invariably naked, who stands at the other extremity. In some, women are weaving, in others, spinning cotton. Usually there are three or four together, the mother, the eldest son's wife, and one or two unmarried girls. The girls marry at sixteen, and shortly these comely, rosy, wholesome-looking creatures pass into haggard, middle-aged women with vacant faces, owing to the blackening of the teeth and removal of the eyebrows, which, if they do not follow betrothal, are resorted to on the birth of the first child. In other houses women are at their toilet, blackening their teeth before circular metal mirrors placed in folding stands on the mats, or performing ablutions unclothed to the waist. Early the village is very silent while the children are at school. Their return enlivens it a little, but they are quiet even at play. At sunset the men return, and things are a little livelier. You hear a good deal of splashing in baths, and after that they carry about and play with their younger children, while the older ones prepare lessons for the following day by reciting them in a high, monotonous twang. At dark the paper windows are drawn, the amado or external wooden shutters are closed, the lamp is lighted before the family shrine, supper is eaten, the children play at quiet games round the andon, and about ten the quilts and wooden pillows are produced from the press, the amado are bolted, and the family lies down to sleep in one room. Small trays of food and the tobacco bon are always within reach of adult sleepers, and one grows quite accustomed to hear the sound of ashes being knocked out of the pipe at intervals during the night. The children sit up as late as their parents and are included in all their conversation. I never saw people take so much delight in their offspring, carrying them about, or holding their hands in walking, watching and entering into their games, supplying them constantly with new toys, taking them to picnics and festivals, never being content to be without them, and treating other people's children also with a suitable measure of affection and attention. Both fathers and mothers take a pride in their children. It is most amusing about six every morning to see twelve or fourteen men sitting on a low wall, each with a child under two years in his arms, fondling and playing with it, and showing off its physique and intelligence. To judge from appearances, the children form the chief topic at this morning gathering. At night, after the houses are shut up, looking through the long fringe of rope or rattan which conceals the sliding door, you see the father, who wears nothing but a maro in the bosom of his family, bending his ugly, kindly face over a gentle-looking baby, and the mother, who more often than not has dropped the kimono from her shoulders, enfolding two children destitute of clothing in her arms. For some reasons they prefer boys, but certainly girls are equally petted and loved. The children, though for our ideas too gentle and formal, are very prepossessing in looks and behaviour. They are so perfectly docile and obedient, so ready to help their parents, so good to the little ones, and, in the many hours which I have spent in watching them at play, I have never heard an angry word or seen a sour look or act. But they are little men and women rather than children, and their old-fashioned appearance is greatly aided by their dress, which, as I have remarked before, 
is the same as that of adults. There are, however, various styles of dressing the hair of girls, by which you can form a pretty accurate estimate of any girl's age up to her marriage, when the coiffure undergoes a definite change. The boys all look top-heavy and their heads of an abnormal size, partly from a hideous practice of shaving the head altogether for the first three years. After this, the hair is allowed to grow in three tufts, one over each ear and the other at the back of the neck, as often, however, a tuft is grown at the top of the back of the head. At ten the crown alone is shaved and the forelock is worn, and at fifteen, when the boy assumes the responsibilities of manhood, his hair is allowed to grow like that of a man. The grave dignity of these boys, with the grotesque patterns on their big heads, is most amusing. Would that these much-exposed skulls were always smooth and clean! It is painful to see the prevalence of such repulsive maladies as scabies, scald-head, ringworm, sore eyes, and unwholesome-looking eruptions, and fully thirty per cent of the village people are badly seamed with smallpox. End of section 12「of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan」by Isabella L. Bird。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in March 2012. Letter 10, Part 3. I have had to do a little shopping in Hachiishi for my journey. The shop fronts, you must understand, are all open, and at the height of the floor, about two feet from the ground, there is a broad ledge of polished wood on which you sit down. A woman everlastingly boiling water on a bronze hibachi or brazier, shifting the embers about deftly with brass tongs like chopsticks, and with a baby looking calmly over her shoulders, is the shop woman but she remains indifferent till she imagines that you have a definite purpose of buying, when she comes forward bowing to the ground, and I politely rise and bow too. Then I or Ito ask the price of a thing, and she names it, very likely asking four shillings, for what ought to sell at sixpence. You say three shillings. She laughs and says three shillings sixpence. You say two shillings. She laughs again and says three shillings, offering you the tobacco bon. Eventually the matter is compromised by your giving her one shilling, at which she appears quite delighted. With a profusion of bows and sayonaras on each side, you go away with the pleasant feeling of having given an industrious woman twice as much as the thing was worth to her, and less than what it is worth to you. There are several barbers' shops, and the evening seems a very busy time with them. This operation partakes of the general want of privacy of the life of the village, and is performed in the raised open front of the shop. Soap is not used, and the process is a painful one. The victims let their garments fall to their waist, and each holds in his left hand a lacquered tray to receive the croppings. The ugly Japanese face at this time wears a most grotesque expression of stolid resignation as it is held and pulled about by the operator, who turns it in all directions that he may judge of the effect that he is producing. The shaving the face till it is smooth and shiny, and the cutting, waxing, and tying of the queue with twine made of paper are among the evening sights of Nikko. Lacquer and things curiously carved in wood are the great attractions of the shops, but they interest me far less than the objects of utility in Japanese daily life, with their ingenuity of contrivance and perfection of adaptation and workmanship. A seed shop, where seeds are truly idealized, attracts me daily. Thirty varieties are offered for sale, as various in form as they are in colour, and arranged most artistically on stands, while some are put up in packages decorated with what one may call a facsimile of the root, leaves, and flower, in watercolours. A lad usually lies on the mat behind, executing these very creditable pictures, 
for such they are, with a few bold and apparently careless strokes with his brush. He gladly sold me a peony as a scrap for a screen for three sen. My purchases, with this exception, were necessaries only, a paper waterproof cloak, a circular, black outside and yellow inside, made of square sheets of oiled paper cemented together, and some large sheets of the same for covering my baggage, and I succeeded in getting Ito out of his obnoxious black wide awake into a basin-shaped hat like mine, for, ugly as I think him, he has a large share of personal vanity, whitens his teeth and powders his face carefully before a mirror, and is in great dread of sunburn. He powders his hands too and polishes his nails and never goes out without gloves. Tomorrow I leave luxury behind and plunge into the interior, hoping to emerge somehow upon the Sea of Japan. No information can be got here except about the route to Niigata, which I have decided not to take. So, after much study of Brunton's map, I have fixed upon one place and have said positively, I go to Tajima. If I reach it, I can get farther, but all I can learn is, it's a very bad road, it's all among the mountains. Ito, who has a great regard for his own comforts, tries to dissuade me from going by saying that I shall lose mine, but, as these kind people have ingenuously repaired my bed by doubling the canvas and lacing it into holes in the side poles, and, as I have lived for the last three days on rice, eggs, and coarse vermicelli about the thickness and colour of earthworms, this project does not appeal me. In Japan there is a land transport company, called Riku and Kaisha, with a head office in Tokyo and branches in various towns and villages. It arranges for the transport of travellers and merchandise by pack-horses and coolies at certain fixed rates, and gives receipts in due form. It hires the horses from the farmers and makes a moderate profit on each transaction, but saves the traveller from difficulties, delays and extortions. The prices vary considerably in different districts, and are regulated by the price of forage, the state of the roads, and the number of hireable horses. For one ri, nearly 2.5 miles, they charge from 6 to 10 sen for a horse and the man who leads it, for a kuruma with one man from 4 to 9 sen for the same distance, and for baggage coolies about the same. This transport company is admirably organized. I employed it in journeys of over 1,200 miles and always found it efficient and reliable. I intended to make use of it always, much against Ito's wishes, who reckoned on many a prospective squeeze in dealings with the farmers. My journey will now be entirely over unbeaten tracks, and will lead through what may be called Old Japan, and as it will be natural to use Japanese words for money and distances, for which there are no English terms, I give them here. A yen is a note representing a dollar, or about three shillings seven pence of our money. A sen is something less than a half penny. A rin is a thin round coin of iron or bronze with a square hole in the middle, of which ten make a sen and one thousand a yen. And a tempo is a handsome oval bronze coin with a hole in the centre, of which five make four sen. Distances are measured by ri, cho, and ken. Six feet make one ken, sixty ken, one cho, and thirty-six cho, one ri, or nearly 2.5 English miles. When I write of a road, I mean a bridle path from four to eight feet wide, kuruma roads being specified as such. ILB End of section 13